Hi, everyone. Welcome. We're so thrilled to have you here tonight. My name is Whitney Donhauser, and I'm the Rone Mental Director here at the museum. So we are really thrilled and pleased to have the author, historian, Russell Shorto, back on our stage. Um, his talk, Our 400-Year Battle with Water, will explore the parallels between the early Dutch efforts to tame the tides and the city's present-day response to climate change. So Russell is the best-selling author, of course, I think many of you know, of The Island at the Center of the World and Amsterdam, a history of the city's Oh, sorry, did I, uh, let's see. Uh, so let's see, his second book is Amsterdam, A History of the World's Most Liberal City, um, and a contributing writer to the New York Times Magazine. He served as the director of the John Adams Institute in Amsterdam from 2008 to 2013. So Shorto's newest book, Revolution Song, A Story of American Freedom, will be released on November 7th. So tonight, um, and he, we have many supporters of our program who've been longtime friends of the museum through the exhibition uh, Amsterdam, New Amsterdam, which he worked with us on in 2009, and many other collaborations. So we're thrilled to have him back here. So following his talk tonight, he will be joined by Pauline Krika. Oh, good, okay, that was good. Um, of the Dutch city, The Hague, for a brief question and answer period. So Pauline Krika has been the mayor of The Hague since March this year. Uh, previously, she served on the Municipal Council of Amsterdam as deputy mayor for economic affairs, airport and seaport, and as mayor of Arnheim, and as a member of the Dutch Senate of the States General. Okay, uh, thank you so much to the Netherlands American Foundation for really helping making this event possible with additional support from the city of The Hague and a special thanks always to our friends at the Consul General of the Netherlands in New York who've been really great promotional partners for us for many different things, but tonight too. Um, and the Gotham Center for New York City History and Hunter College History Department and New Amsterdam History Center and NYU School of Professional Studies. So after the program, we invite everybody to join us on the first floor for a reception uh, where actually I don't believe we have the short Russell Shorto books. Do we have other books available? Uh, they're available for the shop. His newest book, however, comes out on November 7th. So, of course, I also invite all of you to come back to the museum to continue the conversation about climate change at our coming, upcoming program called the City of Rising Waters, which is a symposium on Sunday, October 22nd at 2 p.m. And this is a, really marking the fifth anniversary of Superstorm Sandy, a watershed moment for New Yorkers' awareness of the devastating impact impact of climate change. This program will examine how New York City can survive and embrace its future as a coastal city surrounded by wa rising waters. So speakers will include Amitav Ghosh and reporter Andrew Revkin. And there's more information. I know I saw it um, on the table as you all were checking in. So and just finally, this is a moment when I ask you to please turn off anything that buzzes or beeps. Um, but we do encourage people tweeting. So if you'd like to tweet, we would encourage you to use the hashtag MCNYLive. So now it's a great pleasure to warmly welcome Russell Shorto. Thanks. Do you want to switch? Here, I'll leave this in your hands. Okay. All right. Thanks. Thank you very much, Whitney. Uh, thank you all for coming here in the rain to see me. Thank you to the Museum of the City of New York for um, supporting my work through the years, but also for being an oasis of history and perspective in a city that tends to pave over uh, history. Uh, as uh, Whitney said, the um, mayor of The Hague, um, Pauline Kricke, is here, so we're honored by your presence. Dolph Hochewoning, who is the consul general, the Dutch consul general of the Netherlands, is here as well, and I understand the mayor of Bogota is here. We're honored, welcome. Um, um, so I am going to talk about, uh, I have to look at what I'm talking about, our 400 year battle with water. I'm gonna talk about um, 
Dutch history, Dutch uh, New York history, and about water and climate change. But really, what I'm going to talk about is uh, cultural sensibility. I think what the US has to do, what pretty much every place has to do, uh, is reorient their way of, of thinking about things. Uh, and I think this particularly applies to the US. Uh, and the Dutch have been doing that. The Dutch uh, culture um, developed along with this battle against water. So they've been doing it for a long time. And yet, as I'll get to in a few minutes, the Dutch also recently have had to readjust. Um, I'll start with an image that uh, I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Uh, you probably saw it coming in. This is New Amsterdam. This is the so-called uh, Castello Plan. It's actually uh, uh, an early 20th century redrawing of the Castello Plan. The Castello Plan is it's, it's so-called because the original was made in 1660 and then thought lost, and then it turned up in an Italian castle, a castello, a, a Medici palace. Um, it's, uh, it shows New Amsterdam at its height in 1660. Um, they, they applied for a charter as a Dutch city. They won the charter. And so New York City considers itself, it's, it's the date of its founding from the date of that charter. Um, and uh, it shows, it mar so after it won this charter, uh, the city instituted a uh, city council. The city council ordered uh, uh, the building of uh, defensive works, and they ordered a census, and they ordered this plan to show. And on this, uh, you, we actually know every one of the, I think it's 252 houses, and we know who owned them and who lived there. And it's a, a marvelous thing, and now I ought to know where the, is that going to, yes, the pointer. So the fort is on the site of the old uh, customs house, if you know where, know that. This, of course, is the Heerweg, which is more commonly known as Broadway, uh, Bowling Green there. Um, the, they built this wall at what became known as Wall Street, not as is commonly thought to keep the, uh, the Indians out, but to keep the English out, and it, it did not work. Um, this is, uh, they being Dutch and being in, in, into water management, they built a canal. And this is Broad Street, so-called, because once they paved it over, it was the, one of the broadest streets in town. Uh, this is, this uh, image is indicative of the Dutch presence here, of uh, the Dutch uh, having contributed mightily to New York and, uh, and its, uh, its DNA, so to speak, and of uh, the sense of order and, with which the Dutch went about uh, their colonies. And that same sense of order comes out of uh, the Dutch culture. As I said, the Dutch sensibility developed differently from uh, other parts of Europe. You think of Europe, uh, uh, you think of cities like Rome and Athens as going back thousands of years. Dutch history is much more recent than that. It uh, essentially begins in the Middle Ages. And in the Middle Ages then begins this divergence between the Dutch and more or less everyone else in Europe. So if I say, Europe in the Middle Ages, there is, I would imagine, a particular image that comes into most people's minds. Um, and I think it is not so far off the mark um, because the basic unit of much of Europe, of society in much of Europe, was what is called the manorial system. You had a manor, a, a castle, and you had a nobleman who lived in it. And there was a lot of land that came with it that this nobleman controlled. And on this land were all kinds of people, a society. And he, uh, he lorded over them. There were peasants, there were carpenters, there were wheelwrights and bakers and so on. And uh, if they had disputes, they came to him and so on. And this system lasted for hundreds of years. It was very stable and it was fixed, meaning uh, wherever you were born into in this system, chances are your children would occupy the same rung. If you were a carpenter, your daughter would marry a carpenter or someone at the same level. If you were the nobleman, your children would, would occupy that rung. Things worked differently in the Netherlands, and that was because when people moved there, um, 
they had to deal with water right away. The, ne the Netherlands is called the Low Countries because it's the lowest part of Europe. It's where uh, several river systems drain into the North Sea. And people realized that if they were to survive, they had to band together to build dams and dikes to keep out the water, to keep dry. Uh, and this illustrates it pretty nicely. Uh, from 1300 to around 2000, uh, the, the, pop, the, the Netherlands increased in size by about 100%. Uh, the Dutch have a saying, God made the earth, but the Dutch made Holland, and they mean it literally. They created land, and the act of creating land is in a way what this is all about, because I was just talking about my you know, Monty Python image there, and a fixed system. Here, having made new land and, ma and banded together to make the land stable, to keep it stable, seems to have, I, I think of it as kind of a trigger, like flipping a switch. It sets off this impulse, because once they did that, once they created land, your little village created this new land, uh, people began to farm it, they began to, to grow, to, to have dairy cows grazing there, a cheese industry comes into being. They start to make money, they start to get rich. They realize that they can make life better for their children than it had been, <clears throat> had been for them. And so this innovative impulse sets, sets in motion, and this is what sets them apart from people elsewhere in Europe. Now when I first when I first went to the Netherlands, I had heard about the polders. Polders are land reclaimed from the sea. And uh, I went to Amsterdam first, and I was eager to get out into the countryside to, to see these polders. And I went with, I, my daughter is here, she's a, an adult now, but she was a child at the time, and her sister and their mother and I went out and I, <clears throat> I um, didn't see these polders. It thing, I saw lots of nice nature and nice old houses, and I, did, I, I wondered where the polders were. Well, it, eventually I got um, educated a bit. The road is a dike. You see it's up, it's raised above the surrounding land. The surrounding land is polder, reclaimed land. Here again, the road is a dike, the house is sitting snugly behind it. Here again, the road is a dike, and you can see, I believe, this land is actually lower than the level of the water. So this is a country, this is a landscape that is entirely, almost entirely manufactured, made, uh, remade by people. We are still used in this country to driving for an hour and you're in the woods, you're in the country, you're in sort of wilderness. In the Netherlands, it is made and it is made by people. Uh, this is an illustration of what I'm talking about. You have a river. And you, this is a, a situation, this is an artist's rendering of a situation around 1200 AD. You have a river, and the river, uh, every spring, the, the shoreline changes, and you have to deal with this situation. Crops flood and so on. So, you build dikes on both sides, you put the houses behind the dikes, and you dig these trenches along the side because the ground is very waterlogged, and you dig the trench and the water drains into into the trench, and then you can farm that land. Down here, you, they built a dam, and w through the dam, they could further control the river. They could, uh, they could make canals and so on, and, and turn the problem of water to, to an advantage. If you move forward uh, a few hundred years in time, this, is, this area in front is that dam. Amsterdam is called Amsterdam because the river is the Amstel, and it is the dam on the Amstel. Uh, and move forward, and, and you see in the background there, you can see the mass of ships. Here's the river going down to the uh, open water. Uh, and move forward again in time, and this is the dam square in Amsterdam today. You, here's the dam, here's the, uh, it's now a street, it's paved over where the river was. Uh, you can see here what is the royal palace, it was built, it, that building was just being built in 1650 when this painting was made. Uh, Oops. And this then shows, here's the dam, here's the river, as it was, and that's the train station, central station, which blocks the view to the open water, but that's, that is this. 
That's what we're looking at here. So this is how the country was built up, how it was developed and around the issue of water. This innovative impulse that I'm talking about, uh, which came about through having to deal with this problem of water, uh, sets in motion uh, innovations that go in every direction. Most, uh, maybe most important in the early going, in a business sense. They set up, they, they, they create what uh, is essentially a new kind of company, one that is permanent and one that uh, everybody can buy shares in, shares of what they call stock. And uh, so everybody can participate in these big ventures. This is the East India Company outpost in Batavia in, in what's now Indonesia. And you can see him, he's basically pointing to say, you know, look, we know how to do this with water, we know how to manage this. Um, this is their outpost in Bengal, in India. Uh, this is uh, one of the canals in Amsterdam. And again, taking the, the river, taking the problem of water, it's, in, in, uh, it's uns the uncertainty of it, and making it into an advantage. So these houses were built in the 17th century, and with every one of them, they were built by strong individuals. Uh, what I mean by that is, going back to this flipping of the switch, these people, uh, some of them were part, were members of, uh, uh, shareholders of the East India Company or the West India Company. Many of them had their own companies and they would form a business, go out, and you could, you could be one of these people and go to the East Indies to buy spices or whatever it was that you did, ride with them on a ship halfway around the world, come into the eye, the harbor, and from there, transfer to a smaller vessel and ride right up to your front door on the canal. So these cities were made for individuals. They weren't made for royalty. They were, <coughs> excuse me, they were made for these newly empowered individuals. Uh, and you could, you see, every one of these has a, what is called a hoist beam at the top. So the ship could come up to your door, and the way these, this, the structure of a Amsterdam canal house is you d do your business, the man, his office is here, the family lives here, and your stuff is stored up here. So you, from the ship, you, with the hoist beam, you pull it up into, your, into the attic, and uh, so each one of these is a self-contained uh, uh, business. It's a family enterprise, and it's a business. Uh, this is Hermann Domer, who is nobody. He's not an important person. Um, but I, I have him there because he was painted right by Rembrandt. Rembrandt uh, is one, is another, you know, I'm talking about this uh, innovative impulse uh, having set off uh, a, a whole revolution in the business sphere. But it carried over in many other spheres to create what we think of as, as the Dutch Golden Age in the 1600s. And that carried over into art. In art, uh, Dutch, we think, when we think of Dutch art of that period, we think of this turn to the secular, which is true. In much of Europe, art had mostly been for churches and on religious themes. As people get emboldened and empowered and newly aware of themselves as individuals, their very um, notion, their very definition of the individual changes. I mean, this is kind of hard to get your head around, but until that time, people thought your, your idea of yourself was completely bound up with your community, with your church, your parish, your synagogue, your guild, your, your manor, whatever it was. So that when you, if, you tr if you took all that away, there would be very little left. Beginning in this time and beginning in the Dutch provinces, something like our sense of an individual is what people begin to develop. And one of the things they do is they start to commission painters to paint their portraits, <coughs> which I think is a lovely literal illustration of this point. Uh, that, and you see other Europeans going to Dutch cities and first of all finding it strange that in the market, like on Dam Square, there are people selling vegetables and people selling fish and then there's a peop uh, someone selling paintings. And so, th th and they were remarking on how strange it is that the Dutch are buying, ordinary people are buying pictures of ordinary people doing ordinary things and going home and hanging them uh, in, on their walls. And this to us is, is kind of normal behavior, but it was new and, and they were the first ones doing it. And it relates, I think, all the way back 
uh, to this thing that sets, sets them apart. And what I think uh, distinguished Rembrandt, what made him famous in his time, was the fact that, not that, I mean, there were a lot of people who could, who were very good painters, but he seemed to go one better. He seemed to be able to portray who you were inside. And that's what, pe that's why, uh, so Hermann Domer was a nobody, but he was a, a rich nobody. He was a furniture maker. And you had to be rich because Rembrandt charged a lot. So people would buy these paintings and take them home and put them on the wall and just stare at themselves, you know? And, and in the act of doing that, you can see them uh, um, the, uh, it, entering into a new relationship with themselves and with their community. Uh, here is his wife. Um, who uh, once again, you know, these people, and these people, these portraits, all of these subjects that he painted, for the most part, are not important people, but every one of them has a Wikipedia page, you know? Every one of them, these portraits <coughs> hang in in uh, the Louvre or the Metropolitan Museum or the Rijksmuseum, and it goes back to that, that um, reasoning. All right, so I'm talk talking a bit about the form formulation of this Dutch sensibility. Now we're back in New Amsterdam. We're back in New York. This is slightly earlier in time than the Costello plan that I showed you. And we're looking at it from the East River. And you can see the fort and the church in the fort there. Uh, this is Pearl Street. The first row of houses built was built along Pearl Street. All this is water filled. Uh, out here somewhere is where the uh, Staten Island Ferry Terminal would be. Uh, this is the, the tavern, which once they got a, uh, 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 city council, that tavern became city hall. So that was the first city hall. And if you go to, uh, Pearl Street and, um, County Slip on the pavement, they have marked out where they excavated and they found the, the, uh, outlines of the foundation of it. So it's still there. Um, so when this culture of uh, the Dutch in the 17th century, while they were going to the East Indies and going to, to India and traveling all the world and becoming this great uh, trans shippers, they also founded a colony in the New World called New Netherland with its capital of New Amsterdam. And they did it in, with a very uh, specific purpose in mind, actually two purposes. One was they were Throughout this whole period that I'm talking about, they were fighting a war of independence against Spain. For, it was an 80 years war, and that's what it was called. Um, and uh, they also did it for, this was a West India Company settlement, and it was founded in order to make a profit. They were initially dealing with beaver pelts, and the West India Company could never really make a profit. It, it kept failing, uh, which was frustrating to the founders because the East India Company was taking in money from the Far East like mad, but they could never make it go. So uh, finally, they uh, relented and gave up their monopoly. And from that moment, all these, you know, I was showing you those, uh, the canal houses and saying that many of those were owned by individuals who had their own companies. People who had their own trading company would send one of the sons from Amsterdam, for example, to New Amsterdam to set up an office. And so that begins really the life of, of New York, so to speak, as a, as a vibrant place. Uh, this is a map of the, the colony. You see New Nederland. Um, and you can see how expansive they were in their ideas about the colony. And you also see how focused they were on water. They've they picked this colony in it, between two English settlements, New England and Virginia, because they understood the world in terms of water. And here, so here's Long Island, and you can see it says Long Island, in the, which the Dutch named. Uh, here is the Hudson River, which they called the North River, and which is, still goes by that name. Uh, here is the, what they call the South River, or the Delaware. Here is what they called the Fresh River, uh, the Connecticut River. And so, Look at, where's Quebec? Quebec up there. So they had this expansive notion of what their colony comprised. Um, however, it didn't last, needless to say. Uh, and you can see right here, it says New York. And York is spelled in kind of a funny 17th century Dutch sort of way. Um, which tells you that this map this version of the map, there were many, many versions of this map. The English used it, it was, it was considered the most useful, most accurate map of the East Coast for a long time. So this version was printed after the English took over. 
and they kept most of the, the Dutch names, but New York is still there. Um, without going into a lot of detail, uh, this the, the, in my book, The Island at the Center of the World, I uh, tell the story of the colony of New Netherland largely as a story of a struggle between these two, Peter Stuyvesant and Adrian Vanderdonk, uh, for uh, control over what the colony could become. Uh, Stuyvesant was the West India Company official in charge of the colony. Uh, and he was a company man, and he was trying to follow their orders, and the company only cared about its profits. Vanderdonk realized, as uh, did many others in the colony, that um, it, things were, uh, people were, the colony was developing different from other outposts in the Dutch world. People from different backgrounds were putting down roots. Uh, it was remarkably multi-ethnic. In the 1640s, a Jesuit priest recorded hearing 18 languages being spoken, and there were only at that time about 500 people. So you might say New York was New York even before it was New York. And, and yet it was all working. It was all working under Dutch auspices. You see things in the records. Uh, for, uh, you, you see names, and you think, you get fooled into thinking everybody's there is Dutch. Uh, but someone named Carol van Brugge was actually an Englishman named Charles Bridges. They just kind of Dutchified his name. Um, so there was a lot of that. Uh, and, uh, the, and, and Vanderdonk became appointed, uh, they called him president of the commonality, to oppose the West India Company because these people wanted what I was referring to before. They wanted the Dutch government to make this a, an official province so that it could be settled, the full blanket of Dutch uh, laws and social systems and so on could be made to apply to it. Uh, Vanderdonk didn't win everything, but he did win a municipal charter for New, for New Amsterdam, which as I said is the, the date in 1652 is when uh, the city of New York um, counts its, uh, as its birth. Okay, so the Dutch, Colony eventually went away, but uh, there are a lot of things that remained from it. Uh, one of the things that we get from the Dutch colony is Santa Claus. Uh, the Dutch uh, Sinterklaas, uh, here, he, and for some reason in the Netherlands, he comes every year from Spain to the Netherlands. And you see his uh, servant, Sarte Piet, there, who is a figure of much debate in the Netherlands these days become, because some people think he's not exactly politically correct. Um, but the Dutch Sinterklaas in, in New York, under the English, becomes Santa Claus. And uh, this is a 19th century illustration, I think, and it's also kind of nice because it shows you Dutch water management in there. Um, this uh, handsome devil is James, the Duke of York, and it's because of him that this place is called New York. He was the brother, <coughs> the brother of Charles II, the king, and kind of the mastermind of the English takeover. And uh, after they took over Charles in his honor, uh, named New Amsterdam, New York, named the second city, Beverwijk, Albany, because he was also the Duke of Albany. And there was a movement for a time to name what became New Jersey, Albania, um, also after him. And there are a lot of New Yorkers who still think of New Jersey as Albania. <laughs> I, I think I'm going to copyright that joke. It works every time. Um, Okay, so this gets back to my theme now. Uh, this is the essence of what I'm talking about when I talk about this different sensibility. This, you know, I talked about the building of the Dutch cities and in the Golden Age, uh, Amsterdam, Rotterdam, The Hague, Utrecht, Delft, all these cities were booming and, and digging canals and expanding. And it is very poor land on which to build, to build a big brick house. So what you have to do for every one of these houses that they built, of the thousands and thousands of houses, you have to take a pile, which was like a 30 or 40 foot um, trunk, tree trunk from Scandinavia, and you had to pound it. You know, like in the city, you see pile drivers and you hear them pounding it down into the soil. You had to do it, and you had to do it by hand. And in, there are not many of these images of 17th century uh, of these teams doing this. Each one has a rope and the, and the big iron block is up here. And they would heave and, uh, 
And they would do it. There, were, there are songs which, at least until recent times, kids learned in school, which were these chants that these guys, do, do people still learn them in school? Do you, <laughs> was that, that was generations ago. Um, uh, and uh, so they would uh, sing these, this, uh, these chants to, to do it, and there's usually a, a, a barrel of beer there. And like these buildings behind there, are all, every one of them had do required dozens of these. To be to to create an outline of a foundation, then you could build stay, uh, your your building on. The reason I say that this is um, uh, kind of the essence of what I am here to talk about is that what the Dutch started doing in the Middle Ages is um, what they call the polder model. The polder is land reclaimed from the sea, and it is a it is a communal effort. We all have to get together to solve this problem because in, this, in the case of water, if we don't, we'll, we'll get wet. Um, so it forced this collectivist thinking. We will all do it together. And that's what you have illustrated here. And this kind of thing still goes on. I mean, there are a lot of Dutch people who debate you know, with immigration and, and, and social media and everything else, all these forces going on, the polder model is breaking down. Well, as an outsider, I would say that it is still surprisingly uh, in place. This is what I would call the polder model today. This is an organization called the SER, the Sociale Economi Serrat, the Social Economic Council. Um, which is a very unsexy sounding thing, and, and I, I dare say it's unsexy looking. But um, this, in, if you try to translate this into an American context, imagine um, labor, the major labor leaders and the heads of the largest corporations and people from government all getting together and deciding that they will tackle a big problem that society has. Um, let's say the Russian interference in the election. Imagine all those people getting together and saying, we're gonna tackle this problem, and they, they study it, and then they come up with a position that they think the government should take. And they present it, and it's debated, and people talk about it, and by and large, in the Netherlands, when they do this, the government does indeed adopt that position. So it's. In a, one thing it is, is a way around the, um, the strife and the difficulties of a democratic political system, which we know a lot about these days. Uh, it provides this other level, this other measure of input. And, and the people who are represented represent something like 80% of the population. So they can claim to have a certain uh, legitimacy to, to, to advise. So this, to me, is another level, another means by which you see this polder model in action. Um, when I first went to the Netherlands, I, uh, like I guess many Americans, I had this notion that, oh, it's a welfare state. That means a lot of people are lazy and kind of living off the, the, the state. Uh, and I learned that, and there is certainly some of that, um, but that notion, welfare state, does not merely encompass the notion that healthcare ought to prov be provided for all. It doesn't merely encompass the idea of ideas of things like uh, um, uh, workers' compensation and, and pensions. It, it's, it's much broader than that. This is a map of the Netherlands of, of train networks. Each of these different colored lines is a train network in the, in the country. This is obviously a map of train networks in the United States. Now, I live in Maryland, over there, and Maryland has exactly two train lines in it. Maryland is bigger than the Netherlands, which has that many. So to me, this is another indication of, not, not exactly the polder model, but the thinking behind it, the, the notion that w being a society means something. We will all, and I'm gonna go all the way back to the beginning now in the manor system in Europe and this development of these people banding together to, to uh, fight against water and creating this collective, collectivist sensibility. Um, and if I, if I just uh, compare with, say, Wyoming, which is about five times the size of the Netherlands, no train lines whatsoever. So it's a very different sensibility that has developed historically in America. Now I'm slowly making my way to this point of this difference in sensibility that gets to the issue of uh, 
of uh, different approaches to water management and climate change. Um, uh, this another handsome devil. Um, this is um, John Wilkes, who was an English member of parliament in the uh, 1760s and 1770s, who made a big fuss in England at that time about the English Bill of Rights. Uh, the England had been granted a Bill of Rights in 1689, and uh, it was never really enacted. The kings didn't want to deal with it, and th the aristocracy was all tied to the monarchy, so people didn't get these rights that they had been promised. Finally, decades later, in the 1760s, John Wilkes starts to um, make a fuss about this. And uh, his message particularly resonated in the American colonies, where they were starting to be worked up about England. And um, people here named Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania, for example, is named after him. They named cities after him. They named their children after him, which came to a stop with John Wilkes Booth, who kind of tarnished the name. Um, but he was... Uh, he is one of the, I mean, I put him here to represent something, but he is this representative of this idea of an individual spirit. We're all individuals, we have individual rights, we don't, as opposed to this collectivist way of thinking. And th that then becomes, you know, the American notion, the American uh, cowboy ethic, that we are all individuals, we don't need the government in our lives, we don't need, to, and, and, what I'm kind of arguing here is that, you know, there's, there's a point to that, but what the Dutch have been able to do is to recognize that you have this collectivist group, and out of it come these very powerful, wealthy individuals who are able to do impressive things, but they, they maintain the awareness that their power as wealthy individuals comes from the collective. So there's this notion of balance there. Um, moving forward in time, the, that American cowboy thing becomes kind of a cartoon thing, but it's still there. The cartoon represents something. I mean, he, he's called the Lone Ranger. He doesn't need anybody. He doesn't need you to build trains for him or provide health insurance or anything like that. And then, you, I'm, I'm sorry to do this to you, but, <laughs> but this um, is directly, uh, it, it comes out of that cartoon. The idea, you know, it, and, and it becomes dangerous. You get to the point where it becomes a danger to the planet. Um, the, this was uh, from a little while ago, withdrawing from the climate deal. Just yesterday, it, the UN, the, the US announces that it's uh, withdrawing from the, uh, uh, the emissions, the Clean Air Emissions Pact, I forgot what it's called. Uh, okay, so let's just get right up to, to today. Biscayne Bay in Miami, uh, if uh, according to estimates of sea level rise, all this will be underwater by the end of the century. Uh, Miami, this is Delaware. We see this all the time now. Uh, obviously, this is Hurricane Sandy. This is now, this is Houston, um, which is an interesting story because it seems to me to represent uh, in a very pointed way, the folly of uh, the way we've been going about things. Houston is a very flat place. Over the past 20 years, um, there ha they have lost 38,000 acres of wetland in Houston, and wetlands act like a sponge when, it, when there's a storm, for example. Uh, and they lost it to development. There was a federal law that said if a developer takes up wetland, you have to replace it. There has to be a net balance, but they have they managed to not do that. These are all cars that were destroyed in uh, Harvey, right? I'm getting my hurricanes. I think it was Hurricane Harvey a couple months ago. So this is just a place where they took all these cars that were destroyed by flooding. Okay, now the Dutch have had to change as well their thinking. Their thinking was always build dams and dikes and then you're protected from the sea. Well, it doesn't work anymore like that. This is the city of Nijmegen uh, on the German border. This is the Waal River that Germany's here and the North Sea is here. Um, and it's got this big bend at Nijmegen. And uh, so they started noticing about 30 years ago that in the spring with the, uh, the, the spring thaw, you had flooding. The whole city was starting to flood. So they began talking to people about what they had to do. You see they spent time trying to shore up um, and realize that's not going to work anymore. So they had a series of meetings over 15 or 20 years with people in the city, with ordinary you know, inhabitants, 
to try to talk to them about a, a completely new way of thinking from what they had been doing for a thousand years. They, ha they said, we have to start to make room for the river. We can't just block it out anymore. So what they came up with is this. Uh, here, they basically, all these people, they bought their land, moved, gave them land elsewhere, and they agreed to make room for the river. They made a channel here, this island they created, and uh, this island has mixed use now. It's used for, there's a, there are parks and playgrounds and things, and, and it's known, however, that at a certain time of the year, that island will be largely underwater. So this is a, a, you know, a big change in their uh, thinking, which they, using the Polder model, meeting after meeting after meeting, got people to buy into because, again, there was, there was no other option. I, I think I have to be, hur be hurrying now. This is Hank Ovink, who um, was the head of spatial planning and water management in the Netherlands, and after Hurricane Sandy, he became the advisor here to the, uh, the task force that was charged with what are we gonna do about uh, resilience and so on. Uh, I wrote a profile in the New York Times Magazine of him three years ago, and he suggested to the photographer, what if I get in a swimming pool in my suit? Uh, so he has brought some of this Dutch thinking to uh, not just New York, but to the US. And uh, I guess the main thing he has done, again, this idea of meetings and, and bringing all the stakeholders in, into uh, the picture, of not saying, here's the solution that we smart people know, and, and so we'll just impose it on you, but having meetings and, and having uh, teams of people compete for solutions to different problems in, in uh, different parts of the US. So this is the, the big U that is uh, envisioned for Lower Manhattan, which is not just wall, but it's a combination of wall and, and high ground and green space. And uh, so, so you have different kinds of uh, uh, ability to deal with uh, climate change and flooding. Uh, I, I have to hurry through. This is. Hoboken, um, where Don Zimmer, the mayor, has been very active in uh, embracing things like uh, water parks, or parks where uh, Rotterdam uh, is an example of a city that has a lot of, um, they, they have embraced this multi-faceted uh, approach and have, for example, um, playgrounds that are below street level. So you go down to the playground to play basketball or whatever, but there are drains all around there, all around the perimeter. And in the event of a terrible storm or flood, uh, that all those drains come to this area and it fills up with water because a lot of the problems have to do with not just your whole place is wiped away, but as in Houston, you lose, you know, if you have three feet of flooding for a day, well, you lose a lot of money that way. Um, back to uh, these, this image of the Dutch canal houses and each of these housing a strong individual and a family, and yet there's a certain universality, there, there's, an, there's a sense, an egalitarian sense, a sense of community uh, that is still the case today. In, this is very modern Dutch uh, canal houses, so to speak, uh, but you see the same, the same principles apply. I'll end with this image. Um, we, you know the, the fable of Hans Brinker, the little Dutch boy who sticks his finger in the dike and saves the town? Uh, I was talking to a, a Dutch architect friend of mine um, a while ago, and he said, you know, that uh, I was written by an American. And I said, yeah, I, I actually knew that. Um, but he told me further that it's that story, that heroism, would be incomprehensible to the Dutch. And I said, why? And he said, because... This is all an American <laughs> individual, excuse me, <clears throat> individual sense of, uh, of a hero. You know, we all, we want a hero, one hero who saves the day. He said, in the Netherlands, the dams, the dikes, the water boards, the, 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 the dikes are monitored constantly. There are computer programs and things. So if there was a break in the dike, in the Dutch story, it would be the town water board that would be the hero. So, um, so then I actually asked uh, someone, I can't remember where this one is, if that's the case, why did you put this, this little um, statue up? And he said, we did it for American tourists. So, <laughs> thank you all very much. I think we're gonna shift 
things around a little bit here. And um, Mayor Krika, if you would like to come up, uh, since we have an actual mayor of an actual Dutch city here, um, I think we should uh, avail ourselves of that and, and find out what is uh, going on uh, right now. Do you want to take a seat? Thank you. Are we on? Mayor Kirko, welcome to New York. Thank you. Um, well, let me just begin, I and mean, we'll ask uh, people to ask questions if they have any, but let me ask you, if I might, what can you summarize for us what The Hague has been doing in the past few years, in the past decade, to deal with climate change? If you, if you look at The Hague, of course, all you know that um, uh, it is a city at the sea. And with uh, the rising of the sea level, we are threatened that the whole city of The Hague will be washed away. Uh, and when uh, visitors come from abroad, I always say, well, look at the, um, uh, the posts, the lamp posts, see how high they are. That is how high the, uh, the sea will come if the dikes or the dunes will not hold the water. And the strange thing is that the people in the city of The Hague and in the whole of the Netherlands don't, couldn't care less. They don't have the feeling that the sea, sea will swallow them very shortly. That is good. Why I think why that is, is the people uh, in uh, The Hague and in the Netherlands are very confident that the state or the municipality will do its utmost to prevent that from happening. And we do. Uh, because at Scheveningen we uh, make a very nice boulevard. Uh, we work with the water there because by changing the boulevard, we give businesses uh, a, a place where they can have their uh, business. We give people a place where they can have uh, leisurement. Uh, we, we do the preventive measurements, but we also uh, take into account that it has to be fun or being business. If I look through my eyelashes to, which is my country, uh, I think the important things behind this is that um, cities and also our national government have money to d take this sort of measurements. And how do they get that money? By taxes. And we complain a lot about taxes. You cannot go to any, any bigger gathering and people will say, oh, the taxes are horrible here. But if I tell you a secret, we love to pay taxes. Because these taxes make that we have this welfare state, this tax is made that we can live our lives in relatively peaceful circumstances, and this tax is made that our governments can pay for the things we really need and protect us from the, from the water. So it is also a way of saying that we are still a community. We take care of each other, not near really necessary one to another. There's room for improvement there. But as a, as, a, as a country and as a people, we think that uh, we have our priorities straight. We have the water, we have the climate change. We have also these this things that are, that are much bigger than the individual, and we share that burden. Questions for either of us or comments? Yes, sir. I'm sorry, congratulations on a, on a great historical overview of the Netherlands. I think you missed the 1953 flooding in Zealand where a lot of people were killed. And the point for my question is really the money that was raised to subsequently build the, you know, the, the, the waterworks there in Zealand ran into the tens of billions of dollars and in fact became an export industry for the Netherlands when they built in Hong Kong the airport there that was reclaimed from the sea and in many other countries all around the world. And, and my question to either one of you really is, what is being done currently actively in the Netherlands to promote this as an export industry for the Netherlands? There's a number of very big companies there that have the skill and the reputation and expertise to do it. What, what is really the opportunity, if you quantify it in billions, and what is being done you know, to, to do this with climate change now around the corner? There must be a huge market for this, but I don't hear much coming 
about this. Thank you. I, um, if I understand, your, the, the gist of it is what are the Dutch doing to market themselves as water management experts around the world? Whatever they're doing, I think it's working pretty well because they're everywhere. Um, and uh, places all around the world that I, just as one potential, I don't know this for a fact, but one example of it may be this talk. I'll, I'll bet the Dutch, is the Dutch government uh, involved in this at all? Yes. Supporting it? So there you go. Um, uh, the, um, but they are very aware of, and, and Hank Ovink, who I showed in the swimming pool, every time I talk to him, he's on a different continent because he, I mean, this is in demand everywhere, and the United States is uh, unusual, at least the leadership of the United States is, in wanting to sort of bury your head in the sand. But mayors and, and governors, are very active in Miami and San Francisco and uh, in all of these places. They are calling on the Dutch and Dutch expertise in places like Del Taras, the organization that uh, investig that's kind of cutting edge investigation of, of engineering problems in the, in the Netherlands are, I think, really actively promoting themselves around the world. They are, they are actively promoted, uh, whether it be by our Consul General, who is on the first row here, uh, or by our embassies. Uh, and um, I think you can see something else also on that. Uh, because the Dutch usually make something commercial out of a problem they had. Uh, and this, this water thing is a very big problem. And the Delta works basically uh, uh, close uh, the Netherlands from the influence of the sea. That was done uh, uh, in the 1930s, uh, so it was a long time ago. It costs a lot of money, but it gave us all sorts of techniques, which are, which we are uh, now selling all over the world. Uh, uh, even our now king uh, was um, in water management before he came became uh, our king. So it is an important uh, thing, and I, and I think we do a lot of promotion for that. But it shows you that the Dutch make something commercial out of a problem they had. to whoever uh, uh, needs their expertise. Also, there are engineering firms that have um, uh, offices here in the United States where they uh, you know, work directly uh, selling that same expertise. So that is, that's, I would say, an additional answer to the, to the question of the person who asked. Although it's, it's kind of interesting when you are saying And uh, one of the things that actually is, is interesting in this thing is that the cause of the, of the revolt against Spain was actually the centralization of the Hoogheemraadschappen, or the water management boards, in Brussels, where the, where the, the This is inside baseball here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> where basically, uh, the problem was that people said, wait a second, we don't trust the central government to take care of our dike because they will have other priorities and the money will not go here. And the point is that all of this was highly community managed and the funds were community managed. And you see the same thing, the Hoogheemraadschappen are still a significant part of the water management in the Netherlands. Yeah, I, it's a good point. And um, bringing that to the US, uh, so it's a region, these are regional issues. Um, and a big part of the problem here uh, I, I talked about, I kind of focused on American cowboy individualism at the individual level, but the same issue applies with cities and with states. We have this very strong autonomy. We are called the United States, and these states want their own you know, decision-making decision uh, powers, and cities as well. I was um, in Long Island uh, a couple of years ago reporting on how towns were dealing post Sandy with uh, things and the mayor of this town was showing me along the beach how they had built up this big uh, water break and it just stopped and I said why does it stop there and he said well that's the next town I mean here you know it, you'd have to you have a hard time breaking down this this you know autonomy but it is happening and I think especially in this region it's it's really happening a lot yeah Thank you. 
in large American cities, one of the problems we have, we see it here in New York with Sandy, is the challenge of people who have been flooded out by major storms, but when, at the end of the day, they want to go home, they want to go back and live or work exactly in the same place, which is clearly now vulnerable to storm surges and floods, and this is, uh, this is a real problem. In cities in the Netherlands, how, as a matter of public policy, do you deal with the, the, the need to encourage people to relocate? Fortunately, with uh, the water, uh, we are pretty safe in, in all parts of the Netherlands. Uh, but there are some parts who are more vulnerable, vulnerable to water. Um, and what we do is uh, twofold. We uh, have long discussions because we still do that. Uh, and in the end, we decide what part uh, of uh, a city, but it, it is not in cities, what, what part of uh, some smaller villages are uh, too um, expensive to let people live there. Because we all carry the burden of having people live on a land which is going to flood. Um, and after this long debate, uh, th we then say to the people who live in that area, you really have to move. Um, because we as a society cannot hold up uh, uh, everything we have to protect your land. Uh, but we don't do it harshly like this. Uh, we do it after long debates. But in the end, we also pay people to leave the land then. So they can uh, 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 establish themselves uh, on another part uh, and, and start all over again. Uh, I think that's how we deal with this. Yeah, I do have an example. Uh, I was mayor of Arnhem uh, before I became mayor of The Hague. Uh, Arnhem is the bordering city of Nijmegen, uh, and we had uh, projects with uh, um, uh, room for the river as well. Uh, also projects where we uh, um, enhanced, we made the river uh, bigger uh, and had uh, uh, um, uh, commercial and uh, leisure uh, things with it. But there was a small polder which was too expensive to keep then, uh, and we did it like this. So there are exp examples. The, yeah, the big U uh, she asked about in Lower Manhattan is one of the things that is in development now. And I have to say that, as Whitney um, uh, said before, she made mention of my new book that's coming out about the American Revolution. Um, I've been involved in that for the last three years, so I haven't been you know, directly involved in what's been going on lately. But that's part of the, the, uh, what's going on in the whole New York City area. Um, yeah, they, uh, well, New York, the Meadowlands is a huge um, uh, topic in its own right because it's such a complicated area which has been, has had to deal, has had um, environmental, huge environmental problems and so on. The cities along the Hudson River, I, I talked about Hoboken, um, there are projects going on in, in, in Brooklyn, I mean, almost everywhere, the, the Jersey, all along the, the Jersey coast, and what Hank Ovink helped to establish is this ongoing series of pulling together design teams of designers and, and marine biologists and engineers and so on, and having them all in, a, I, guess in an, I guess what he's a, uh, trying to do is an American version of this, of the Polder model, uh, where you involve the community in a long series of meetings and you have people submit designs and then you have a competition, so there's kind of a, uh, a challenge involved, and the big U was is one of those that that has uh, um, come out of this. And the city, uh, I think, in 2013, the city of New York issued about a 400-page report summarizing where things stand, where they want to go. Now, one of the alluding, getting back to the previous problem I referred to, I thought it was interesting that that report almost did not mention Connecticut or New Jersey. So just as an indication of this kind of, you know, autonomy or myopia that we tend to do here. Now, even since then, I think it has changed a lot. Uh, and so there's a lot more sort of reaching out to, in, to include others. 
Yes. yes. Uh, I lived out of the battery for 10 years. I looked out the window uh, seven years ago when Sandy came. Well, we lived five feet above high tide at any given moment you could have a flood. Is there anything in Holland comparable to the Long Island Sound, a very large river, and low land? I would say yes, but I'm not. Uh, I, I'm not a, 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 an expert on these things. Yeah. What, what is very analogous is, in fact, where the sea arms in Zealand, uh, which okay, flooded yeah. in 1933. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Same situation. It was in full blown spring floods, uh -huh. heavy winds yeah. that bulked the water up into those sea arms yeah. and basically flooded you know, a number of the large islands. That's uh, that. Yeah, that may very well be an analogous situation. In Zealand, if you look at it on the map, it's got these fingers of land. Uh, and so the way that the storm, the, the big storm affected there may be uh, similar. And it also had a very Dutch reaction because that was uh, um, um, the, uh, it was not the start of the Delta Works, but it was the closing of the Delta Works. We had big debates be before uh, 1953 if we as taxpayers should pay for that because uh, the idea was it was only half of the land and not the whole land. And all, no, you can imagine all that sort, those sort of debates. After the flooding of uh, Zeeland in 1953, the whole country all of a sudden knew that we had to do that. So the, the, the reaction, I think, is a very Dutch reaction to a catast catastrophe, which that was, because uh, uh, people still, if they're older people, still have traumas uh, from this flood uh, because they remember it and they, uh, it, it is really vivid in our, uh, in, in our culture. But I also think that the reaction is a typical Dutch reaction that we are going to solve it then. Together. Uh, one more question, I think, sir. Um, I think they're not flashing. They're not flashing. Yeah. What they do is showing that they have nothing to hide. And if you would close the curtains, you would, would say, I have something to hide. I think that's much deeper in our culture than, uh, than, than, than you would assume. Um, so um, I think we're not hiding something. On that note, I, uh, I also want to thank Tracy McFarland for organizing this whole event, and thank you all again for coming. Thank you.